Hello, and welcome to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, your weekly dose of the top pro-life news and issues, all from a Catholic perspective. I am your guest host, Caroline Bortle, filling in for Catherine Hadro while she's away. Thank you for joining us. In this week's show, this Advent season, a hospital near the birthplace of Jesus Christ honors the Holy Family with its pro-life work. We bring you the story. Elizabeth Warren vows to wear a Planned Parenthood scarf if she is sworn in as president. We speak out. And this. It's our favorite night of the year. This is only our second year doing it, but it has been awesome. We bring you the story of Night to Shine, an annual prom night event that rolls out the red carpet for people with special needs. But first, our top story. The Democratic Attorneys General Association has adopted a new litmus test, requiring any candidates endorsed by the group to publicly state their support for abortion. Attorneys General are the front lines of the fight for reproductive freedom. They have the power to protect your rights. That was New York State Attorney General Letitia James in a video for the Democratic Attorneys General Association announcing the new requirement. In a statement, the group said it will only provide financial support, digital tools, and other campaign assistance to candidates who publicly commit to safeguarding abortion. And joining us now from Washington is Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton. Thank you for being here. Hey, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it, Carolyn. What is your reaction to the Democratic Attorneys General Association's announcement? You know, in some ways, I'm not shocked that they've moved this way because it seems like they've been heading this way for a long time. I'm, I am surprised that it is the Attorney General's Association, the Democratic Attorney General's Association, given that what we're supposed to do as Attorney Generals is follow the rule of law, follow the Constitution, and for them to say that this overriding policy of, of only supporting people that will um, be for abortion is, is, is surprising given that there are so many different laws relating to what attorney generals are supposed to do as it relates to abortion in various states. The Democratic Attorneys General Association is a committee specifically dedicated to electing Democratic state attorneys general. Will this litmus test help them do that? You know, I, I'm surprised that they did it because that will actually keep certain candidates out that would be better candidates at winning in certain states. And we've certainly seen that in Texas uh, when our governor ran against Wendy Davis. She adopted this you know, anti uh, or pro-abortion stance, and she was overwhelmingly defeated, even in areas that traditionally Democrats have done well in. So I, I think it's a mistake on their part. And, and this is one of those mistakes I wish that they, they would change for the sake of the country. We spent a lot of time talking about abortion extremism among the Democratic presidential candidates. Do you think ideological purity tests on abortion will become more common down ballot races? I certainly hope not, but that seems to be the, the, the direction of the Democratic Party, which is interesting to me because, in, in my opinion, very highly discriminatory against certain people of certain faiths um, and, and, and faiths that represent a lot of people in America. And so now you're saying if, if you're a certain faith, you hold a certain religious views, or certain views based on your, your faith, that you no longer can be part of the Democratic Party. We're not going to help you. And I find that um, discriminatory and, and very disturbing that that's the, the, the direction of the Democratic Party is really about discrimination. This announcement focused on ways attorneys general can protect abortion. But can you speak to how they can protect life? Well, we have an obligation to uphold the law. That's our job. We don't make law. We don't get to decide which, which laws are put into place. And so if my state has, which they do, they have certain protections for the unborn, we have to enforce those laws as long as they're not unconstitutional. And so that's our job. Rule of law is not to pick and choose laws we like or don't like. We have to enforce the law as it's written. I also wanted to ask you, you are helping a nine-month-old baby girl who is fighting for her life. Can you tell us about that case? So a hospital that, that this, this nine-month-old baby was at decided that they were going to take life-sustaining treatment away from this young baby and the parents did not want that to happen and so uh, there was a lawsuit filed and we stepped in to, to agree that this lawsuit was appropriate because we believe the state law it doesn't provide any due process in other words the, 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 the hospital doesn't even have to tell them why they can just come in and take life support away and we think that's unconstitutional and a violation of, of the Constitution. What are the next steps for her? Well, we're going to continue to fight to save her. Um, I know that there's going to be likely litigation going on forward, and we're hopeful that the courts will realize that 
this baby has a right to life. And our Constitution guarantees the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And this certainly is the right to life. So Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton, thank you. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it, Caroline. Joining us in studio is Prudence Robertson, a communications associate with the Susan B. Anthony List. Welcome and thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. So can you speak to uh, Attorney General Ken Paxton's pro-life leadership? Yes, Attorney General Ken Paxton is a great pro-life leader. Before he was Attorney General, he served in the state legislature and he championed pro-life laws that included stopping late-term abortion, enforcing health and safety regulations for women, as well as informed consent laws. And he also led the charge in investigating Planned Parenthood when um, they were harvesting and selling baby body parts in Texas. And that eventually um, revoked them from the Medicaid program in Texas. So we're so thankful to Attorney General Ken Paxton for his consistent and strong pro-life leadership. So on the show, there have been many conversations about the Democratic presidential candidates and their extremism on abortion. Do you think that the news on the attorneys general is going to show that this is infiltrating the rest of the party? Yes, I would say so. I mean, this litmus test really underscores the abortion extremism of the Democrats across the board. The attorney general has one job, and that is to enforce the laws that have already been passed in the state legislature. So to say that every Democrat attorney general needs to vocally support abortion is really just a far cry from the safe, legal, and rare rhetoric that we're used to hearing from the Democrats, and it really is a, a great issue. How do you think that this announcement will impact the attorney general elections in swing states? Well, it certainly won't help the Democrats. I mean, the majority of American voters reject this abortion extremism that the Democrats are pushing, and that um, can be seen in Kentucky in the recent uh, election with Attorney General Daniel Cameron, who ran on a pro-life platform. The Attorney General before him, he failed to enforce the pro-life laws that had already been passed in Kentucky, and he didn't stand for the pro-life views of Kentuckians. Daniel Cameron made that an issue in his run, and so did SBA list canvassers when we spoke to Kentucky voters at the door, and that resulted in Daniel Cameron winning by a landslide. And so it's clear to see that the Democrats don't feel welcome at the polls when they're greeted by this abortion extremist message. And that combined with the pro-life momentum that we're seeing in the states nationwide, I mean, 60 pro-life laws passed in 2019 alone. When you combine those two things, it's clear to see that the Democrats are putting themselves in a politically vulnerable position leading into 2020. So I also want to get your opinion, hear your thoughts on the recent advertising campaign mm. of Planned Parenthood, the $1 million advertising campaign that they have to regain Title X funding. What can you tell us about that? Yes, so this really seems to me like a last ditch effort by Planned Parenthood to pressure pro-life lawmakers who support President Trump's Protect Life rule. The rule disentangles taxpayers from the abortion industry and it draws a bright line between abortion and family planning. And Planned Parenthood pulled out of this funding when the law was enacted. And that just goes to show that abortion really is a top priority for them. And this whole situation, this million dollar ad campaign, really also goes to show that Planned Parenthood has plenty of money to throw behind political battles and that they never really needed taxpayer money to begin with. So really quick, can you tell our viewers why they lost Title X funding to begin with? Sure, absolutely. So they pulled out voluntarily when the Protect Life rule was enforced because they didn't want to stop providing abortions. And uh, like I said, just this bright line between abortion and family planning is what the Protect Life rule enforces. And um, it was pushed by President Trump and his administration, and we're very thankful for that and for all of the pro-life uh, wins that we have had in this administration. And Planned Parenthood just refuses to comply with anything that affirms life. So this also will target Martha McSally, of Arizona, mm -hmm. uh, Corey Gardner of Colorado, and Tom Tillis of North Carolina. What can you tell us about them? Well, the common denominator with these three senators is that they're pro-life leaders that are running in competitive races in battleground states, and that is a major threat to Planned Parenthood. They understand that um, this pro-life Senate majority that we have right now and the pro-life administration that we've seen under President Trump is confirming judges. Over 150 have been confirmed by the president, and that wouldn't 
be possible without this Senate majority, and that's why Planned Parenthood is targeting these pro-life leaders. We have endorsed all three of these candidates in past cycles. Uh, in 2014, we supported Tom Tillis in his Senate run. He was one of the first candidates that we were on the ground for. And uh, Martha McSally in 2018, we worked with local allies in Arizona to get out the pro-life vote for her. And um, yeah, this just really goes to show that Planned Parenthood will stop at nothing to promote their agenda. And it also reminds us of the importance of getting every pro-life voter out to the polls come 2020. So we are out there, we're visiting voters um, in these battleground states, and we plan to uh, speak to persuadable Democrats, independents, and even moderate Republicans, because this election truly is so vital. We must reelect President Trump. We must reelect this pro-life Senate majority so that we can respond to this pro-life momentum in the states with pro-life laws. Communications Associate of the Susan B. Anthony List, Prudence Robertson, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Caroline. The Trump administration has made significant progress in implementing pro-life policies internationally, such as protecting life and global health assistance program and updating the Mexico City policy. However, domestic organizations that work overseas are not subject to the protecting life and global health assistance program, and some receiving international family planning funding under state and foreign operations promote abortion. The Shaheen Amendment to the Senate State and Foreign Operations Bill would increase funds to these groups. And that brings us to this week's call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com to tell Congress not to increase funding for so-called international family planning groups as the money will be used to promote abortions. Once you get to this website, you will be able to type in your basic information so we can tailor this message for your specific lawmaker and send it straight to them. Again, the Shaheen Amendment to the Senate State and Foreign Operations Bill would increase funds to groups that actively promote abortion. It's important that the pro-life movement tells Congress not to increase funding for these groups. Tell Congress not to increase funding for so-called international family planning groups by going to ProLifeWeekly.com. Turning now to our next story. This Advent season, a hospital near the birthplace of Jesus Christ honors the Holy Family with its pro-life work. The Holy Family Hospital in Bethlehem is a Catholic teaching hospital operated by the Order of Malta, a Catholic lay religious order. This Holy Land Hospital treats all patients who seek care, regardless of their religion or their ability to pay. The hospital serves the poor and at-risk women and children in the West Bank of Palestine by providing state-of-the-art maternity care in a neonatal critical care center. We are joined now by the president of the Holy Family Hospital of Bethlehem Foundation, Michelle Burke Bow, who also serves as the Order of Malta Ambassador to Palestine. Ambassador, thank you for being here with us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Tell us about the work of the Holy Family Hospital. You know, our hospital is an infant and maternity hospital that delivers around 4,700 babies a year and we have a life-saving critical care unit that takes care of premature and sick babies weighing as small as one pound. Wow, so the Holy Family Hospital has been growing. Can you tell us about the exciting new developments? Well, the um, exciting new developments really are is that we are out in the desert every single day delivering care to people who are unable to come to the hospital, the mothers and the baby who are in the desert, and also offering care to the people in the villages that are isolated by some of the walls that have been put up. So it, it's really a life-saving um, hospital in the Holy Land. But the most important thing is that we offer 172 critical jobs so that we em employ people in a region with high rates of unemployment and that creates a lot of hope in the Holy Land. Unfortunately there are political tensions in the Holy Land how does the Holy Family Hospital serve as an example of peace? You know, we like to call it an oasis of peace and a beacon of hope. Um, it serves as an example of peace in that Muslims and Christians work together every day, saving the lives of the tiniest babies and the mothers who are most vulnerable and in need. And when a baby needs a critical care surgery that we can't offer in Bethlehem, we can then have the babies go to Jerusalem where they can have life-saving surgery in an Israeli hospital or by an Israeli doctor. So we have the three great monotheistic faiths working to save the lives of the most vulnerable in the town where Jesus was born. 
Recently, the Holy Father returned some relics to Bethlehem. Can you tell us about that and what it means for the faithful there? It was such an exciting development. You know, um, at Holy Family Hospital Foundation, we always bring prayers to the manger. Um, our donors and our friends send us in prayer petitions, and we bring them to the manger. And one day somebody said, you know, Michelle, the manger is actually in Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome. And I said, well, that's true. The wood of the cradle is there in Rome, but the place of the manger is in Bethlehem. And so the president of Palestine, Mahmoud Abbas, asked the Holy Father if the Holy Father would return the manger to Bethlehem. And the Holy Father is so good and loving and loves Bethlehem. And he took a piece of the relics of the wood of the manger and presented them to Bethlehem. And there was a beautiful procession from the um, gate of the patriarch at uh, Bethlehem right to the church of the nativity. And so today when you visit Bethlehem, you'll be able to see the place of the manger and also the wood of the manger. So it's just a, um, such a hopeful development because so many people think that the church just had a story in Bethlehem, but the church is centered in Rome. And having this manger reunited with the spot of the manger shows us that the Vatican is in Rome and the Holy Father is in Rome, but Jesus was actually born in the little town of Bethlehem in a wooden manger. So how can our viewers help the Holy Family Hospital in its mission? Well, we could use the prayers of everybody listening for the mothers and babies of Bethlehem. And we have a website, which is birthplaceofhope.org, birthplaceofhope.org. And if they go on that website, they can make a donation and they can read about just the beautiful stories of um, life, hope, and peace in the town of Bethlehem. Well, thank you so much for being here. Again, this is Michelle Burke Bowe, the president of the Holy Family Hospital of Bethlehem Foundation. Thank you. Thank you. And when we come back. It really celebrates life and it celebrates everybody's gifts um, in all different ways. We bring you the story of Night to Shine, an annual prom night event that rolls out the red carpet for people with special needs. Stay tuned as EWTN Pro-Life Weekly continues after this break. Welcome back to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Caroline Bortle, filling in for Katherine Hadro. Democratic presidential candidate Elizabeth Warren pledged to wear her pink Planned Parenthood scarf to her inauguration if she is elected president of the United States. That is this week's Speak Out segment. While campaigning in Iowa last week, Warren, a Massachusetts Democrat, reminded her audience that she wore a pink Planned Parenthood scarf to President Donald Trump's inauguration in 2017 and vowed to wear it again to her own. I'm going to be wearing that scarf when I'm sworn in as President of the United States. This pledge from Senator Warren is extraordinary hypocrisy. Elizabeth Warren claims she supports the little guy, but she's supporting an organization that destroys the littlest among us. Elizabeth Warren claims she supports women, but she's supporting an organization that has failed to report sexual abuse and an organization that fails to uphold the dignity of women. Elizabeth Warren claims she supports unions, but she's supporting an organization that has blocked its employees and some affiliates from unionizing. I hope whoever is sworn in as president on January 20th, 2021, won't feel the need to wear the color of the nation's largest abortion provider. And remember, there is something you can do to counter today's culture of death. Follow this week's call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com to tell Congress not to increase funding for so-called international family planning groups that promote abortions. This week, Catherine Hadro brings you the story of Night to Shine, an annual prom night event that rolls out the red carpet for people with special needs. Here is this week's pro-life focus. While this appears to be a sachet down the runway, these young people are actually making their grand entrance into prom. For its fifth consecutive year, the Tim Tebow Foundation held its worldwide Night to Shine event the Friday before Valentine's Day. Hosted by more than 600 churches across all 50 states and 24 countries, 
Night to Shine is a prom night experience for young people with special needs. All Saints Catholic Church in Virginia's Arlington Diocese was one of those churches where it's estimated more than 100 local guests attended, with even more people coming to volunteer. It's our favorite night of the year. This is only our second year doing it, but it has been awesome. Night to Shine is the total prom package and beyond. Guests get to begin with a spin in a limousine. Ah, I see that. Oh my gosh, it changed color. What? <laughs> I'm excited. I'm more excited. <laughs> After a limo ride, <laughs> Night to Shine literally rolls out the red carpet where these special guests are greeted by their own positive paparazzi. Young women are then pampered by makeup artists. There are shoe shining stations set up for the gentlemen. And in true prom tradition, everyone receives either a corsage or boutonniere. I felt great tonight. Each guest is paired up with a buddy volunteer. I just have to show up and, you know, put on a smile, make sure my buddy has a good time. That's all I'm here for. <laughs> After posing for pictures, the real party begins. I come here tonight to dance and have a party, have a good time, have fun. And let's party! <laughs> what about the dancing? Me! <laughs> Me too! Me too! From the dance floor and beyond, it's obvious these guests with special needs can teach us all some lessons. This event really promotes the culture of life. It really celebrates life and it celebrates everybody's gifts um, in all different ways. So. A lot of the attendants here are very gifted in ways that we aren't, and um, it's so great that here we're all together. We're a community, and it really brings everybody together. So, This sister pair came to volunteer as buddies, inspired by their own sibling with special needs. Well, our sister has special needs, and she really just brings so much joy to our lives, and our lives would be like so much worse if she wasn't here and so just being in a room and a community filled with all of these really special people just makes my heart just like overwhelmed with joy. You have your own crosses in your life and these people have a way bigger cross than you but they're so much more joyful and because if they carry it and they just lead you to Jesus. It seems at times that Night to Shine is more of a gift to the volunteers than to the attending guests. Once you do it once, people want to get involved. So we had a huge number of people. We didn't even have to go searching for, for volunteers. They flooded us. Once, once they heard it was coming again, they, they ran to us. What does a night to shine mean to you? It's awesome. But I love seeing everyone having so much fun. It's, it's just an awesome time. The night's highlight is always when the football player founder makes a special video announcement. What's up, guys? and every guest is crowned as king or queen of the prom. A reminder of how beloved they all are. What does a night to shine mean to you? Being beautiful. Bye. Be beautiful. When these guests are given the royal treatment, it's ultimately the king of kings who shines through. That does it for this edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Until next time, be sure to reach us at prolifeweekly at EWTN.com or connect with us on social media. Just search for EWTN Pro-Life on all the major platforms. And remember, life is a gift, your life is a gift. God bless.